What's up, guys? Welcome to the Mad Men Pod. Uh, this week is just me and Samir. Salim is uh, on the beaches of Cancun or somewhere. But um, while we still have some work to do, we wanted to make sure we stick to our routine and do our Mad Men recording. We are on episode 17, which is uh, pretty impressive, I would say. I think the they say like 90% of podcasts don't make it past episode three. So we're in the 10%. Up 10% um, podcasts. Look at that. <laughs> uh, Samir, you got a pretty sweet setup now. Look at you, man. I know it took me a while to get here, but after after seeing y'all set up, I really needed to step in my game. But got into the new house, needed to make some some changes, got some new stuff in and out, but finally feel like I'm set up for the podcast. Love it. Well, look, guys, we are going to be talking about um, quite a few things. One of them is going to be about Israel and Palestine, and kind of an interesting uh, segment that we're going to do is not necessarily dud or stud, but. Uh, from our very, our own personal perspectives of a brand owner and a marketer and how to really navigate those waters. Um, and then we're also going to you know, give our brands to watch and whatnot. We're going to be talking F1. So really cool episode today. Um, let's get into it. Men go mad. Who's gone mad? Mad men. You're mad. The man's mad. Mad men. I'm mad. Mad. <laughs> All right. So usually we do duds and studs, but this week we're going to be talking about uh, the war in Israel and um, and what's happening between Israel and Palestine and the, you know, our perspective as a brand owner and a marketer. So let's get into it. The unsettling attack from Hamas on Israel last week created a ton of conversation and responses from brands. The attack resulted in more than 900 deaths in Israel, and it's truly a heartbreaking thing to see. So let's talk about how brands are responding during the time of crisis and discuss what we saw. I'm a brand owner. I've talked about that before. I have a clothing brand, and I have made quite the 180 in this regard about uh, how brands should be speaking on sensitive things. Uh, whether it's Black Lives Matter, anything, really any kind of sensitive topic that a lot of brands do speak out on, I've made a 180 on. So my approach a few years back was we should be speaking on it and we should be constantly giving our opinion on whatever the audiences are talking about. So if the general public is talking about it, so should we. Um, I've learned that that's not the right approach. And this is really as a brand owner that is trying to make it. I still have greater aspirations for our brand. And my perspective is that unless you've really gotten to your core audience and you've become um, a staple in your audience, you should really shut the hell up. <laughs> and here's why. Um, so I think brands that really try to talk on these uh, topics, they're really trying to leverage the sensitive topics to try to keep attention on them. And I think that's really inauthentic. That's really, and you have to understand, this is my perspective as a brand owner. I'm not saying this is the case for everyone, but when I see uh, various brands try to make Israel and Palestine about them, or they'll say, uh, you know, they'll put up a Instagram post that we stand with BLM, and then it just has, you know, everything about their branding on it, or prayers for peace, and it sounds sweet and all, but I, I think, you know, if we take it a different perspective and say, just quietly donate to an organi organization you want to you wanna stand behind, try to amplify their voice, not your own, and just shut up. Let people reflect. Let people think about what's going on on their own. I don't think it always requires a celebrity or a brand to speak on every single issue. There's some things that the populace needs to figure out and they need to talk about. The, the people that this is affecting, this is their actual lives. It would, it would be the wrong approach of me trying to sell a t-shirt by saying, oh, here's my opinion about Israel-Palestine. That's just inauthentic. That's the worst thing I could do as a brand. But people seem to ignore that and it further divides everyone. It further, uh, you know, it alienates a lot of my customers or potential customers. It's, we should not be talking on these uh, on these issues, and we really don't know what we don't know. Um, 
And so I would love to hear from actual Palestinians and actual Israelis. But if my timeline or my feed is just filled with brands talking about it, then what are we doing? We're really just trying to keep attention on us. So that's my perspective. What do you think, Samir? Yeah, it's 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 a struggle. I think um, you have a really like honest and, and really clear take on that. I think uh, the 180 that you've experienced is, is very, very valid. I get it. Like, I think there is a lot of this inauthenticity that does come out, um, especially in the advertising world when people, when brands try to connect themselves to real time crisis like this. And we see this happen a lot in the advertising world where, where brands are struggling to craft what that right message is supposed to be. Um, I'm going to share from the brand marketing point of view. Uh, you know, I think we all agree that a lot of people tend to write off brands who show their support as some sort of pandering, or it's a, it's a greedy capitalistic thing. It's a tricky conundrum. Brands don't want to seem insensitive, but the reality is the role of marketing is to drive business. And unfortunately, the business does not stop because of a crisis. In fact, it's, it's quite the opposite. Many, many brands are at risk of losing growth uh, because of this crisis that is happening. It's a very unknown world right now. So when brands choose to participate in the conversation around these sensitive topics, it, it may not always be because of corporate greed, but to sustain the business. Brands who, who market really well are the ones who think of their brand as human. When brand marketing is designed to personify the brand, it's what you look like, how you speak to your audience, who you associate your brand to, the role you play in culture. These are all ways that you demonstrate what type of human you want your brand to be. How you show up in times of crisis is just another space to demonstrate the human in your brand. While empathy should always be a component of a brand's message, empathy marketing should be at the forefront during these times of crisis. It's about understanding the emotional needs and motivations of your customers. Crisis shouldn't halt a brand marketing strategy, but pivot your message to show up as the human you aspire your brand to be. Just like people in important positions of power, brands like yours, Adil, have a platform. And it's critical for brands to use their platform to support the things that they that are important to their audience. Now, I'm not saying it's a brand's responsibility to fight for justice or to solve a crisis, but we know that 73% of consumers say that the way brands conduct themselves during a crisis will impact whether they do business with that brand in the future. So the goal of marketing during a crisis is to build good rapport with your customers so that you can continue to grow for years to come. That doesn't mean it's inauthentic. It just means your, your brand is trying to be human. There's no perfect solution. There's no perfect message. There's no perfect tweet. There's no perfect ad that a brand can push out that will appease everyone. But the right message is the one that reinforces a brand's human element, because that's, that's something that always exists in the world of brand marketing. When times of crisis, it's not, shouldn't be a time for you to shy away. It should actually give you a, a, a pr opportunity to present what kind of human you want your brand to be. Look, I, you know, I have utmost faith in uh, what you guys present as marketers. And, you know, Samir, you have obviously made quite the name for yourself as a reputable marketer. But I do want to talk about some times that it hasn't worked when those brands are truly trying to stand for something. I get it. Like, I know it's it's quite important. Let's talk about Pepsi as an example. So back in 2016, Pepsi released a commercial with uh, Kendall Jenner, and she was she was participating in a Black Lives Matter um, uh, protest. The commercial was obviously criticized and uh, for being tone deaf, and it looked like Pepsi was exploiting Black Lives Matter for personal gain uh, or for corporate gain. So. Pepsi was forced to apologize about it and they had to pull the commercial. Pepsi was obviously, I mean, they've, they're not an up and coming brand. So they're nowhere near my position, right? As a brand owner, but even Pepsi was held to a high regard that, Hey, why are you taking advantage of something super sensitive and doing ads on it? We saw what happened with Bud Light and, uh, supporting, uh, LGBTQ, um, icons, right? In 2020, amid national protests following the death of George Floyd, a lot of companies released statements. 
everyone had it uh, in their bio on Instagram, Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter. I literally just went through uh, multiple Instagram pages that did have that before. They don't have it anymore. Nike doesn't have it. Amazon doesn't have it. Where did it all go? I understand that you want to stand behind something, and but it shouldn't just be for that moment. It should be for good, right? And so that that's where I feel like it's you're you're being inauthentic, and I think people will catch on to that, and people will be like, "Oh, they stood by my side whenever, you know, uh, at that time that I that everyone is talking about it." But when I need them to stand by my side now, and it's not national news, they're not doing it. And so it's, I feel like it's hypocritical. Uh, ben and Jerry's dealt with this in 2021 when they said they would be ending its sales in Israel and um, in the occupied Palestine territories. The company said the decision was based on its commitment to advancing racial and social justice. However, the decision was seen as anti-Semitic boycott of Israel. Like it's, it's really unfortunate. Like these things can backfire. And so what I'm trying to get at is as a brand, you're right. You're as a marketer, you need to keep the message alive. Doesn't matter the day. You, you need to figure out a way to make yourself relevant. Um, the way we talked about Roman Empire last week, uh, there's brands that figured out a way to stay relevant at that time. But when we talk about a women's right to choose, Black Lives Matter, Israel Palestine, like there's some things brands should just figure out that hey, like we're we're not going to do that. We're going to instead. We're not going to be socially active, but instead for our cause, we're going to make sure that we donate to Planned Parenthood or we donate to Black Lives Matter, try to amplify their voices, give them the resources to get in front of more people. And if they happen to put our information on their website, that then so be it. But we're not going to put it on our socials. We're not going to make it about us. We're going to make it about them by giving to them and giving them that those resources. I, I what do you think about that? I, you know, I'm really interested to see or hear your response. Yeah, I mean, there's you're right. There's those examples of brands that have tried and it backfired. Those are those are very real things, and some of those still burn deep in the advertising community. Um, you could probably also find examples of when brands who stayed silent that also backfired. That's why this is really a sticky situation, is because. Number one, you're never going to be able to appease everybody. And number two, in a time of crisis, you as a brand have to make a very conscious decision about what stance you are going to take. And that includes making a message or staying silent. And then once you decide on to take a message, then you have to figure out what you want to say. So there is danger in staying silent. And I think that goes for, for even people in positions of power, right? Like I think there is a lot of noise and silence. I think people feel like silence is a very loud thing, especially when people expect p certain types of people, people in positions of power, big companies, the backbones of our economy, um, and that they choose to stay silent, then then that also hurts. So I think I think there's there's never going to be a clear answer. I think you're right when you said it earlier about every brand, every industry is going to have its own nuances. I also think that when consume, when brands are deciding to figure out what their strategy needs to be around a time of crisis, I do agree with you that it's not about putting your product at the forefront with the intent of driving consumption or purchase of your product. I think it's, it's, it's a space for you to talk about your brand and being able to make gestures that are important and in line with your brand strategy, not about pushing product. I think we saw this a lot during the pandemic where we had and it, the entire world was going on lockdown. But what we started hearing from brands is reutilizing their resources for the betterment of our society, right? We saw Walmart using their logistics chain to get supplies across the country that were not even Walmart products. We saw different brands who had different infrastructure being able to provide for those that, that needed it the most, right? And those are still brand building opportunities, right? Those are still brand messages in times of crisis. They weren't about pushing their own product. And I think that is a positive thing that you want to happen as a brand is what is the message? What is the role that you play? What story do you want to add to your narrative? It doesn't have to be, and it shouldn't be, like you said, about pushing product and getting people to buy you. 
but it should be a moment for you to add to the narrative about what you want your brand to be. I think you bring up a fair point. And the more I think about it, there are some brands that have built their whole business on being reactionary. Take uh, grunt style clothing. They, those guys, they do t-shirts and I mean, some really staunch opinions they print on those shirts about being very pro-American, very anti-immigrant. Um, those guys do a hundred million a year just off of t-shirts like that. Uh, look at black rifle coffee. I mean, they don't, they're not as extreme as grunt style, but black rifle coffee is unapologetically American. They don't, they speak their opinions. They think black lives matter is not worth it. It is not worth talking about. And they would prefer to talk about, you know, other things and about pro second amendment and things like that, which is also sensitive in its own right. But those guys are doing 300 million a year. We do live in a time that is very segmented. If you intend to make it part of your identity, I think it can work. I see what you're saying. And that's the humanization aspect of when a brand can talk about it, but it cannot be just for that moment is what I'm trying to get at. Uh, take Abercrombie. They've done such a beautiful job of rebranding themselves and they truly stand behind inclusivity now in every way, in every single way. Even some of the stuff that still haunts them to this day, uh, the PR nightmares that pop up from their from their old uh, CEO and everything, um, they still have beautiful ways of handling it. All of their models, everything is showing about inclusivity and support for uh, LGBTQ. So th that's that's where you know that okay, it's truly part of their identity. But I, I just I cringe every time I see a brand post about Israel, Palestine, they have no clue. Like, look what happened with Harvard and Stanford. Like, I mean, I think some brands need to realize their their role should be to unite people, not to stand behind divisive petitions and things like that, right? That, that's just the wrong thing to do at that time. So, um, <clears throat> so it's really, really interesting. Any brand should just know who they're talking to and know that if you're going to talk on it, you will alienate some people. And you have to stay committed to it after that. It's not really much backtracking from there. I will take us into our Dutter stud, uh, a little bit more lighthearted. Um, the world's largest company, Apple, is reportedly bidding on exclusive broadcasting rights to Formula One racing. The bid is at $2 billion per year, double what Formula One Group is getting for its global TV rights currently. Apple TV Plus is currently producing a Formula One movie starring Brad Pitt with Joseph Kaczynski in the director's chair, with, while seven-time world champion Lewis Hamilton is one of the producers. Seems like Apple is going big in F1. What do you think, Adil? Dud or stud? So I'm going to talk about it in, in, from two perspectives. Uh, I'm an F1 fan, by the way. Um, I've, I started to like it before the Netflix series came out. And then once the Netflix series came out, I started to love it. And now I'm on the side of, I don't really care about it. And here's why. So for Formula One, this is a no-brainer. Total stud for you guys. Go for it, right? Sign sign as soon as possible. I worry for Apple in this because a company that's making that large of an investment needs to understand what happens when you think that you're going to get the same type of sports viewership uh, throughout a season. I think most sports the viewership increases the more the season goes by. The problem with F1 and the way it's formulated is, and I think this is all racing, but it's about cumulative points that you get through the season. Well, if you haven't been following F1, there's a guy named Max Verstappen. He continuously wins every single week. It's really the, the discussion for everyone is who's going to get second this week. Everyone knows who first is, right? And it's every week, it's Max Verstappen. And so really halfway through the season, Max already gets the champion's uh, trophy. He wins the whole season. And everyone's just trying to figure out who's going to get the uh, the constructor's trophy, which is like which car manufacturer or team is going to win. 
uh, and who's going to get second, third, fourth. It's kind of stupid at, after a certain point. And so I worry for Apple because they're going to realize like, oh, the viewership drops significantly because Max Verstappen keeps winning. The dude is in his early 20s. He has many years ahead. Red Bull does not look like they're losing any steam at all. Um, so unless there's some kind of antitrust type of thing that happens with like they're going to try to break up Red Bull somehow they this is just it's it's just weird like there's just a weird time of F1 right now where it's not even fun to watch so I used to look forward to Sunday mornings and turning on F1 and watching who can win and it used to be competitive it's not even competitive anymore it's really just silly there's no underdog story. There's none of that. You can, you know, at least with the NBA, you can potentially see the Knicks beat the Lakers or what happened with the Miami Heat. Like Miami Heat were, the, were an eighth seed going into the playoffs last season and they went to the finals. That kind of stuff never happens in F1. It's a, it's a fun take. I think uh, when your entire sport is kind of hinged upon this one driver. That's a very scary situation. So I, I hear you about what Apple's potentially risk is here. We keep hearing about this. F1 is bigger now than ever. It's seen huge growth in fan attendance and financial success, um, primarily since Liberty Sirius XM Group acquired F1 in 2016. And looking back at what had led to this massive growth in F1 is its accessibility to the public. So Apple's play for streaming rights is only going to make F1 even more accessible. And it's going to be at a premium price. We know F1 is a premium sport. It's, it's a luxury sport. It costs a lot to be a fan of F1. And Apple knows it's an appealing sport to its audience. Uh, and now that they are on a mission to make it more accessible, just like how Apple has made complex technology more accessible to the average person, this is right in line with their brand. It sounds like a great financial move. It's going to bolster the Apple TV offering. It appeals to their audience really well, and it gets their hands on a sport that is growing really fast. It was just this past February when Apple launched the first season of Major League Soccer Season Pass, and it's already deemed a success with a million new subscribers. We are less than a year into their 10-year, $2.5 billion deal with MLS. Apple seems to always be the right stock to buy, and it seems like the more they're getting into these live sports arena, the more they're trying to bolster up their Apple TV plus offering with more of the exclusive content space, it seems to be the right bet every time. So I'm going to, I'm going to say stud for Apple. And of course, F1 in this, it just doesn't seem like Apple misses. Apple definitely doesn't miss. I agree with that. I just worry for them because I think I love like the MLS play that they have going on. <clears throat> Genius move. They got ahead of it. I, as a fan, I watch F1 and I just get tired of it after seeing the same winner. I'm sure this is how it felt when you were, you know, a, a not a Mercedes fan and you kept seeing Lewis Hamilton win for all those years. But it wasn't that popular then. And it is a lot more popular now. And you see it more accessible now. And it's now they have Vegas, Miami, and, and Austin. So they have three uh, U.S. stops. So it's going to be part of the... American fabric and viewership will grow. But as a fan, I do think that they need to figure out a way to create a Cinderella story somehow. They, there has to be something they can come up with. Um, and I know they've tried to do that. You know, as a sport, they've tried to have like a, a cap on how much they can spend on their car. That was a new thing that they added this past, uh, I think it was this past year or the year before. But that was not a thing. And the, that's why Merce uh, Mercedes, because they had so much money, they did have a really strong car every time. And now everyone's trying to value engineer their ways to like to build the next great car. It's, it, it's just not working. So it, it's still Red Bull. Red Bull keeps winning. So <clears throat> they're going to have to figure out a way to give these other teams a shot. It, it should feel like every week anyone could win. You know, I'm seeing a, I'm seeing a parallel here from... Chicago Bulls winning six titles in eight years. But those eight years also happen to be the fastest growth trajectory for the NBA globally. And it all had to do with one athlete. It seems very familiar here. If we're seeing <laughs> one driver win every year, 
and we're seeing this massive sport continue to grow globally and it's going to keep growing seems to be despite what whoever wins just like it did with the bulls i don't know there's something there's something happening here that that seems a little deja vu you know what you bring up a good point let's just see what happens i will take us into our brands to watch um have you ever wanted to take on a real life squid games obstacle course without the consequence of dying if you lose well netflix is planning to launch a concept called netflix house it's a permanent physical location where fans can fully experience the worlds of their favorite tv shows shop for themed clothing and eat themed food netflix has toyed with this idea in the pop-up format launching 40 different pop-up experiences in 20 cities worldwide but netflix house will be permanent and it's rumored to have two locations this definitely won't be a significant revenue generator, but this is a huge step to Netflix to further themselves as an entertainment powerhouse. We've talked about in the past about these immersive experiences. We we brought up Love Island. There's all of these brands that are building all of these pop-up experiences. And it's clear that consumers want even more of this. Uh, and they want to dive into these entertainment properties that they're seeing on TV. And Netflix is giving themselves a permanent canvas to continue to be able to do that. It just feeds more into the FOMO story. It, it's going to make people feel left out if they don't know these references. I think it's something to watch. Uh, again, I don't think this is going to be a huge revenue generator for Netflix, but this is starting to feel very theme parky to me. And Netflix definitely is sitting on a bunch of very valuable IP that I think they're doing something really smart with. So um, Netflix houses, guys, keep a watch. I, I was going to say that it does seem like it's going to be a theme park type of appeal, but I would probably check it out. I, I agree. They're sitting on a lot of IP now and they should do something with it. I wonder if they're going to have uh, love is blind as a, <laughs> as a uh, segment of it. You're going to go into the pods. I yep. know way too much about reality TV. I got to stop. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. So, um, I'm not going to be talking about a brand to watch, but I will be talking about a new trend. <clears throat> so uh, short form video, we all know, is uh, the new Wild West, uh, and it favors the savvy and the bold. There's one strategy that big businesses haven't really caught on to that really opens up a good growth hacking and social scaling method for up and coming brands. I know many of uh, the people that do send us messages after listening to our pod and stuff are small brand business owners, and this may be a cool approach for you guys. So um, I think the days of having a single, beautiful, pristine profile are gone. Uh, the way that people skim social media now versus before has, has significantly changed. There comes a moment for most creators and brands where things just click and you realize that uh, that there's something else going on. And that's kind of what I start to realize is uh, video views are rising and uh, it's all about how do you get the next slice of people to really look and get lots of exposure between them. Um, so what's been happening is more and more up and coming brands are creating multiple accounts on single platforms. So I noticed this with my favorite shoe companies, as you guys know, Kane Footwear. If you go on TikTok and search Kane Footwear, there's about eight profiles that pop up. And you're thinking like, oh, did people create like fan accounts or whatever? Nope, they're all owned by Kane Footwear. They're just different variations. There's Kane underscore Footwear. There's Kane Footwear altogether. There's, you know, uh, Kane Footwear faves, this, that. Anyways. The point is that what they've realized is they can have different clips that go viral to different segments on each profile. And really what that is doing is uh, you're exposing your brand to more and more people. Um, so once you kind of get that audience for one profile, let's say it's targeted at middle-aged men and you kind of put all your all your uh, videos targeting that, you may have another uh, profile that's going towards women. and it's kind of going to that uh, that demographic. And it's just a really cool way of still driving business to your uh, website without having to worry about how do I get the maximum number of followers on one account? So it's really odd. You can go to these individual accounts and see that there's like 2,000 followers, 
3,000 followers. These are large growing brands. Why do they only have that many followers? Because they don't really care about that now. They just care about giving exposure, creating good video content, and getting the most views possible. Tabs Chocolate is doing that. Cloud Diffuser is doing that. In fact, this podcast, we got the same advice. And uh, our video editor at the time uh, was telling us that try to open multiple accounts and post, post the same clips in each spot and you'll have different types of engagement. And uh, you have to maintain it that way. And we got kind of lazy of that. So we're like, forget that. We're not going to do it. We just went all in on one. But uh, but just a cool new trend to look at. So, um, you know, all the all the small up and coming brand owners that listen to this pod, maybe something you should try out. That's awesome. Yeah, we, we went all in on one. So you guys only need to follow one account. So make sure you go do that. Uh, yes. I think this is this is super cool. I think, um, you know, we, we always say about how social media is the easiest space to experiment for brands. And I think this is just another way of brands allowing themselves the freedom to try different things without the repercussions of it feeling like it's building up the archive of, of all of these different messages and different content all in one place. Um, these algorithms are, are definitely tricky. I think that there's a lot of my counterparts at the agency I work at are deeply invested in trying to understand how these algorithms work. What are the types of content being able to keep up with different content strategies that bring out the best performances in these content in these social media platforms. It's tough. So I think this trend of being able to experiment and try different things and with different accounts, different content strategies, different formats. I think this is really smart for any brand who's, who's trying to do this, this kind of thing. And then like you, like you said, once you find something that seems to work, then you have backed yourselves into a, a strategy that you can continue to work on. So really cool stuff. Um, on our last brand to watch, um, one of the best responses to real-time culture I have ever seen. Um, you know, a few weeks ago, the Cincinnati Bengals had an abysmal performance against the Tennessee Titans, and it led to Bengals superstar receiver Jamar Chase to go viral in an interview after the game telling the media he's always effing open. A week later, Chase goes off for three touchdowns against the Arizona Cardinals, and he posts a picture of a 7-Eleven convenience store since it's open 24 hours a day. Like Chase, he's always open. And 7-Eleven immediately signed him to a partnership deal. And in one week, Chase shows up to the Seahawks game wearing a 7-Eleven shirt. During that game, makes an amazing catch and shows off a necklace with a massive 7-Eleven logo pendant. 7-Eleven launched three t-shirts, a hat, and that very same pendant, which is now sold out. And 7-Eleven even rebranded a single store now called Jamar Chase in the 7-Eleven branding. This was an awesome move for 7-Eleven to capture the hype in real time so quickly that it was actually able to feed the narrative and the story to continue, not just pick it up and, and take what's remaining off of it. This was super impressive from 7-Eleven. I've seen them do this a lot on social media. Like they have really rebuilt their infrastructure to be able to respond in real time to things like this. They have become such a socially driven brand and they're so good at social listening and now they're building an entire content strategy and these types of stunts built off of this one quote always effing open and guess what you're always going to remember that you know that about 7-eleven and now you're going to know that about jamar chase okay i don't know why i didn't care for the heinz ketchup and seemingly ranch response but i love this <laughs> this is so good. So I know this is that studs and duds, but uh, stud, total stud on this 7-Eleven. <laughs> Great job. All right, guys. Well, um, that's the episode. We we did have quite the emotional roller coaster. We started off uh, really deep and, you know, kind of made it up to some of the more, uh, more light, fluffy things. So hope we ended on a high. But I will say to end the episode that, um, you know, all we're doing here is talking about things from a marketing perspective and really we want we want that to be the dialogue every day uh what's happening in israel palestine is uh quite horrific and really sad and it's just unfortunate that it's innocent people that are getting affected in some of these silly politics that happen um and there are some greater hands at play here and people are just using innocent people as pawns and um i hope everyone can just take some time to reflect and think about what really matters and hold their family a little bit closer and think about how blessed we are uh to be living where we do and 
whether you pray or you donate or however you act on it, um, go and do that. All right. So that being said, stay fabulous, guys. See ya. Men go mad. Who's gone mad? Mad men. You're mad. The man's mad. Mad men. I'm mad. Mad. <laughs>